So why do we care about torque ripple? This, this might be the most important part here. Um, so noise and vibration is a, a really big part of why we care about torque ripple. So the first element um, of the torque ripple that we care about is probably the amplitude. So we really want to shoot for less than 2% um, of the average for the ripple. Uh, that, that's kind of just a rule of thumb I've heard from several people, so I'm going to run with it. Some people say 1%, but we'll, we'll go with 2 um, so on a 100 newton meter average torque, this would be a, a ripple of um, 2% or 2 newton meters. Um, but this ripple can be very high in some circumstances. As, as people at HBM know, I have a weird obsession with bird scooters and electric scooters. And I just read a report that those could have torque ripples up to 20%, which, which is really going to be um, quite traumatic and actually start to affect efficiencies in some circumstances. Um, and it should also be noted that, that in certain times, torque reversals can happen. Uh, and we're going to go through a couple examples of where that might be. And these are all things that are just going to affect the vibration of the machine. Um, if you start having torque reversals, you know, those are going to be torsional resonances. That, that, that's not going to be very good. Um, the next thing we care about is frequency for the vibration. So uh, as we saw in the previous example, 36 ripples per uh, you know, electrical cycle we start going to very high cycles, that could be a very high ripple. Um, so the frequency is going to be much higher than its combustion engine counterpart. And uh, from everything I've heard from uh, people who work more in the NVH and gearbox world is this can start to cause gear chatter where the gears are banging against one another. Uh, and that can really degradate the lifetime of a gearbox. Um, Ripple frequency and amplitude can also be affected by the motor controller. Uh, there's definitely suppression techniques that can be used. Um, to make that ripple amplitude smaller. But if you go into something like a hard switching or a six step, which I'll show in a little while, you might actually increase the amplitude and frequency of that torque ripple. So you have to be aware of your operating point as well. Um, and just as kind of a note, machines are going higher and higher in speed. Um, so 20K RPM for, for an automotive application or maybe higher for aerospace applications is not becoming that unheard of. So these ripple frequencies, these vibrations are going higher and higher. Um, so I mentioned a gearbox. Uh, this is an example in the image of a, a little dyno rig we have in my office where we have a permanent magnet machine going into a gearbox. And I just recorded kind of a ramp of torque and speed for a period of time. It looks like it's about 30, 40 seconds. Um, but in the red, I have my instantaneous torque. And in the blue, I have a, a time average torque. And I kind of just ramped around until I found a particularly high ripple point. Now, just looking at this top graph, um, it's easy to think that that red is just noise. But if we zoom in on this particularly high ripple segment, we can see in our bottom screen the zoom area. And, and this is showing us that that's not noise, that we have frequency and amplitude to that torque signature um, that's oscillating around that average. Uh, and, and this... This could be a big problem because gearboxes are going to multiply um, or divide your frequency or uh, your torque. Um, and because of those types of things like gear chatter, we just really want to know where those particularly noisy points are. We want to be able to identify those. And then if we can have a torque sensor at the input to the gearbox, we can understand, all right, is the gearbox causing this? Is the motor causing this? How do we troubleshoot these issues, especially if there's lifetime um, situations. So if we were just to look at that filtered value, we would really get no information from this and we would have a very hard time determining what our problems were. Um, so there is a lot of value in having the amplitude and frequency information available. Now, on that note, um, averages are very useful for doing efficiency and averages are in an electric machine, in fact, essential for doing efficiency. So I'm going to step back to kind of my comparison of the internal combustion engine with the electric motor for a minute. Um, why do we care about efficiency and torque so much? Well, an internal combustion engine is going to sit around 30 to 40 percent efficient. So if we have a 3 percent error, um, let's say from our torque, we're going to have a 39 percent efficient machine instead of a 36 percent efficient machine. This is perfectly believable if you give this number to your boss. He might even be excited because it's better. Um, now, if you go to the electric motor that's running, let's call it 85 to 98 percent efficient for argument's sake, 
um, a 3% error could give you 101% instead of 98% efficient. Now, this, this is impossible. No boss is going to believe this. This is defying physics. Um, so it really comes down to having that accuracy and really understanding what that torque is doing and then understanding how to average it correctly and how to account for these small disturbances. And I go through a little math here just showing that a very small offset in torque, let's say a 0.25 newton meter, could result in being off by half a percent. So it's really not that ridiculous to be off in torque very quickly, especially since electric machines are spinning at a very high rate of speed. Now, in the bottom here, I show the same example that I showed from the gearbox where we have the cyclical torque and then the averages. We really want to average our torque output per rotation of the electric machine um, because if we do it per a single rotation of the full machine and we account for all those ripples in a rotation, we're going to have a really nice average for what that machine is actually outputting. Um, I hate, hate every time I see a customer, and it happens every once in a while, where they're taking a single torque point and calling that their torque for their efficiency. So if they pick a peak or a valley, their machine's going to look particularly bad or particularly good. Um, these types of things happen. So torque ripple just doesn't affect the kind of NVH perspective. It also needs to be accounted for in efficiencies. Um, and you need the accuracy to measure those ripples and then the bandwidth to handle them. Um, and this just prevents you from measuring for one minute instead of 10 seconds. So, and then lastly, um, user experience. Now, I've got some fun pictures here, but uh, bear with me. So, sometimes you can feel torque ripple. Um, and I always think of kind of the vehicle example of uh, when the electric machine is clutching in in a hybrid transmission, because my car, I've, I drive a plug-in hybrid, um, about once a month, the clutch will close on the electric machine and the car will really want to lurch on me. And I can feel that. And that's some of the dynamic torque perspective. Um, but I was also reading an article uh, recently on Torque Ripple um, that was saying that, you know, the 2004 and 2014 uh, Toyota Prius had very different suspension profiles. And it was because they actually did a much better job at reducing the torque ripple. So the torque ripple is actually something that could be felt, especially at slow speeds, by a user of a vehicle. Um, also, the really apparent one is power steering. If you have uh, an electric machine in your powering steering unit, um, you don't necessarily want the driver to feel those you know, six bumps coming from your, your excitation frequency. So maybe you take matters to mitigate um, that power steering torque ripple. On the other side, um, and I, I've got the, the low rider jumping on hydraulics because vibration is a very hard thing to find a picture of. Um, so oh, sometimes you want to feel torque ripple. Uh, and I, I think of this as like the radio dial in the car. You want to have that little torque bump. Um, that's not necessarily an electric machine, but you want to feel that. It gives it a user experience. Uh, but the, the example I like is the drill clutch. So um, a power tool manufacturer I sat in on a a demo from or a, a, a talk from, I was talking about how in their power electronics for their electric drill, they designed in that when the drill hit a torque max, it would just go to zero speed. Um, and this was very elegant. And they gave it to users and carpenters went out and they said, this drill's broken, it's crap. Um, and that was just because they didn't have that clutch experience. So what the engineers did was they built in that clutch experience. Um, so you could define that as a sort of intentional torque ripple. Um, and then the fact that vibrations can be very hazardous. Uh, the plane up here, this is the NASA X-57 Maxwell. Um, it's an experimental electric aircraft that has seven props per wing. And I just think, what if this prop out here had a vibration um, and it started bouncing? And then uh, what if that had resonance with the other electric machines? And you really get this almost very, very uh, strong vibration in the wing that, that could be very hazardous to the machine. So um, it's a concern uh, that, that really needs to be mitigated and accounted for. So now 